Hello, and welcome to the Drug Discovery World podcast, a podcast covering topics around drug discovery and development, pharma and biotech. My name is Giles, and I'm here to take you through this episode. Welcome to this bonus episode of the Drug Discovery World podcast. Today's episode is taken from one of our DDW webinars on the topic of linked data and semantic technologies in healthcare and life sciences. Apologies the sound quality isn't as good as usual, this is due to the webinar recording quality, but we've done our best to improve it as much as we can for this episode. To give you a brief introduction on the speakers and their backgrounds for today's bonus webinar episode. After the introduction by Robert, our editor-in-chief at DDW, the first speaker is Ian Dix, who is Director of Informatics for AstraZeneca. His role involves the leadership of informatics teams in the US, UK and Sweden, primarily delivering competitive intelligence and information analytics services to both preclinical and clinical projects. He is also externally the coordinator of a cross-private-public partnership IMI Translational Medicine Infrastructure Services project, eTrix. eTrix was established to provide data and knowledge management services to support IMI projects through the deployment and development of the Transmark platform. The second speaker is Bernard Munoz, who is the founder of the InnoThink Center for Research and Biomedical Innovation, which is a consultancy that focuses on pharmaceutical innovation, specifically where it comes from and how to get more of it. He previously served as an advisor for corporate strategy at Eli Lilly, where he focused on disruptive innovation and the medical redesign of research and development. Bernard has had many research papers published in Nature and Science. His worth has been profiled by Forbes magazine, and the industry publication Fierce Pharma had named him one of the 25 most influential people in biopharma. And finally, the third speaker is Hans Constant, who is CEO of Ontoforce, who are the sponsors for this webinar episode. He has a background in medicine, biotechnology, business modeling, bioinformatics, portfolio management, knowledge management, and business liaison in the pharmaceutical industry. So now on to the webinar. Uh, hello everyone and welcome to this Drug Discovery World webinar in conjunction with our sponsors Ontoforce. As I'm sure we're all aware, the pharmaceutical industry is undergoing an enormous shift in structure and strategy to enable the reinvention of how we bring new drugs to market more efficiently. Global drug development strategies all reflect new thinking aimed at achieving higher R&D efficiency and a greater return on investment. So semantic technologies which are based on advanced statistics Data mining, machine learning, and knowledge management have been around for years. Indeed, we've covered this subject in DW in great depth over the last decade. But what we're now seeing in instant semantic technologies are that they're gaining much more momentum in dealing with the growing need for more efficient information management. Indeed, better application of semantic technologies in linked data combined with the urgent need for better data sharing may well be the next disruptive way for efficient information handling in, in healthcare and life sciences as a whole. So today we are delighted to have a panel of three experts on this exciting field who will each present uh, some dynamic and forward-thinking perspectives on harnessing the true value of big data uh, within life sciences and, and ultimately Obviously, more importantly, how we can translate this knowledge into effective new therapeutics for the human race. I'm Robert Jordan. I'm the publisher and editor-in-chief of Drug Discovery World, and I'm going to serve as your moderator. Our first speaker is Ian Dix, Dr. Ian Dix. So if you're ready, Ian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Robert, Um, and thank you for the opportunity to speak this afternoon. So I'm going to share with you a little about a project we're running within IMI, the Innovative Medicines Initiative, looking to provide knowledge management services for the translational research that's going on within IMI. The the problem we're trying to solve is how do we manage the data that's being generated um, and how do we look at the analytics in that data by a number of of translational studies, experimental medicine, stratified medicine, precision medicine, name it what you will, but there's a number of these projects running within IMI. And all of them have got some of the have got common challenges in how they handle the data, how they capture data, how they integrate data, and how they analyze data. And the kind of data we're dealing with is we have a patient, and what we're trying to deal with is how do we bring the clinical information around that patient and combine that with a lot of the molecular and disease biology information that we generate through the number of the high content biology platforms that exist. 
ultimately to understand the disease etiology and improve our understanding of, uh, of biomarkers and basically the physiological processes behind that disease. So typically we're dealing with a, a lot of different medical data, medical history, symptoms, family diseases, medications, social history, etc., and also a, a wide range of different omics and NGS technology information. As I say, there's a number of these consortium being formed. Um, within the pharmaceutical industry, the, some of the challenges of understanding disease is, are significant. And of course, understanding the molecular nature of disease is critical for our, our drug discovery and development pipelines. And so the way you're seeing the industry work is increasingly working in public private partnerships to understand fundamental nature of disease. Representing my, my geographical bias, which is in Europe, some of the big investments, as I say, was in, is in within IMI. And then, but you're also seeing activities in the UK with the ABPI, the UK Trade Body for Pharma, working with the MRC, the Tech Strategy Board, uh, NOCRI, the NHS Research Institute. And also then you're seeing other activities in Europe, um, say for example in, in Holland where the Centre for Translational Molecular Medicine is investing significantly in, in translational studies. And so there's a wide range of investment, a lot of investment and in a wide range of diseases bringing together both pharma, biotechs, regulators, academics academic medical centers in trying to understand disease. There's an example from a, a ABPI MRC RA map project just trying to explain the complexity. Although there's this complexity in the science, we've also got significant logistical challenges in these projects. So for example, um, in the RA map study, this is a rheumatoid arthritis study trying to understand the basis of remission in rheumatoid arthritis. We have you know 400 odd patients being recruited 20, maybe 30 different hospital recruiting centers. There's challenges about how we collect, capture the patient information in ECRS. Each of the patients will be having image and x-ray data being generated. A number of samples are being generated from each, each patient. These then need to be processed and, and handled at central hub hospitals and, and labs. And then there's specialist labs for doing all the different types of analytics. So there's a large logistical challenge there in how you handle the samples, how you divide the samples up across the different groups. And then each of the different uh, analytic centers have basically got their own methodologies and approaches for uh, running the, the assays, which need to be normalized. We look at, look at the, a lot of the challenges regarding the limb systems. Then there's challenges about what data you want to retain and, and whether and what data you need to bring together to actually drive the analysis and, and understand the signals that are in that data and hopefully um, understand better the disease processes and ideally um, come through with biomarkers of, of disease. You've got to expand that out with the complexity of the fact that this is a longitudinal study with up to six different clinical visits, a whole wide range of analysis, and so you're ending up with tens of thousands of samples that need to be tracked over time. And so, as you can imagine, there's significant data challenges in this. To simplify the view of that, as I say, you've got clinical data capture systems, you've got image data management systems, sample tracking systems, assays and local uh, lab information management systems, questions about how you're going to manage a lot of the primary data and that will be terabytes of data being generated. All of this has to be done under in a secure manner given the nature of the patient confidentiality and, uh, and consent associated with that data. And then we got challenges in how that data needs to be brought together and normalized, brought under a common ontologies, um, allowing the, as I say, the integration and so hopefully the interpretation of that data. And then we need to think about the analytics tools how we bring reference knowledge together, so existing information around the disease, um, the molecular mechanisms, the genes involved, um, the pathways. And of course, you also need to track in this whole process information around the study design, the protocol design, um, the analysis uh, workflows that are being run. And so with eTrix, we're really looking at that key piece around how you bring a lot of the integrated process data together to affect the decision making and the uh, discovery part of the project. Just stepping back and just thinking, you know, about the, uh, the the big challenges we have here, and these are some of the macro challenges. We all know that, you know, there's this story of big data in this space regards to the genomic and clinical data um, that's uh, being generated through these assay management platforms is causing challenges, not just for the data management integration, but importantly, the analysis and whether we got the correct infrastructure to support that. Typically, each one of these consortia uh, underestimate the amount of data management uh, that's needed. We've got multiple partners working in ways which they've never worked before. So most farmers have got infrastructure to manage this kind of projects internally or with a small number of CROs. In these kind of consortia, you may be up to 20, 30 different partners, all of which have got different needs on how they want to handle and uh, connect with that data. We have public funding challenges with a lot of the data, uh, is a lot of the money going towards research and not services. 
We've got challenges around standards. There are standards. There's, there's a challenge around the adoption of these standards and, and interoperability. And then we've got challenges around patient data security and making sure that this whole process has got the right level of security and access control for uh, the different partners. And a larger scale, which is very pertinent to this, this seminar series here, is the challenge we have with the islands of information. A lot of this data is generated, but where does it end up? How do you access this data once these studies close, which comes onto the sustainability of, of the infrastructure and tools that are behind these services? Well, this came very apparent a couple of years into the IMI process. This is back um, in 2008 or nine. And at that point, we decided as a set of pharma companies, as Town Pharma behind this project, that we should put a service infrastructure project in to support these projects. And this is primarily to remove the redundancy we were seeing in the investments in data management in the in respective IMI translational study projects. And so it's about efficiency, but it's also importantly, we're thinking about the long-term sustainability of IMI and the investments we're making there, how we can access this data long-term. So the project Etrix is really looking to develop an open platform to support these projects, and that's built on Transmart, which I'll come on to in a minute. But we're also looking at the, the services around it, how we support the installation of such a platform, train people on that platform, um, support on the, the data loading, and the standards that need to be developed. There, to say, there's a wide range of standards and a poor adoption right now. Thinking about how we can affect and support the analytics workflow, data hosting, and whether we can centralize some of the data hosting of these projects and to a lesser degree actually curate some of the content. Um, we have secured a significant budget for five years. We're one year into that project and there's 16 different partners. It is a truly public-private partnership with pharma and academic medical centers in Europe, as well as some biotechs involved in standards organizations. As I say, we're building the platform on Transmart. Transmart has got a backbone of, uh, of I2B2, but it was developed by J&J and recombinant and released into the public domain as an open source code base in 2012. Uh, we adopted it because we saw a momentum in the, in the uh, community to move this platform forward with a lot of input from various different stakeholders. So we've got groups in the US and in, in across Europe working on this platform, developing and actually coordinating uh, that build. And that's all done through the Transmark Foundation. Primarily, it's a, it's a platform that allows you to bring these clinical data along with your omic, NGS, flow cytometry data together and actually start allowing analytics over that, that content. It's not a semantic platform as it stands today. There are significant investments going on right now to turn it what, what is quite a monolithic platform into something which is a lot more uh, structured with clear service layers. And one of the things we're looking to do over the next year is actually put some clear Sparkle endpoints and, and, and semantic interfaces into this platform, which I'll, I'll come on to and I'll touch on to at the end of the, the talk. As I say, we are a service project. Some of those uh, stratified medicine projects that we're supporting are here in the oncology, safety, information, and infection space. Most of them in IMI. We're also supporting, as I say, RA MAP, which is an MRC, a UPI based project. Um, the framework of architecture we're looking to put in place, we've got a number of pieces. On the left, the clinical data management. On the right, a lot more of the reference pathway disease biology information. We're trying to split out a number of the analytics pieces so you can plug and play with a lot of the common technologies that exist. And then there's pieces around the collaborative um, environment you need to manage a lot of the metadata around the project. As I say, we're doing this in collaboration. This is the ETRIC structure. We're also working very closely with TRAIT, which is the Dutch national initiative, um, a very similar structured project trying to solve a lot of the same problems. So you're really seeing a consortium of consortiums and a lot of goodwill to actually coordinate work. At the same time, we're working with knowledge management groups in the consortia and also uh, the foundation. And this is just a, a fragment of the, the ecosystem of, of people working in this area. Running a consortia is a rather a challenge. So there's been a lot of work around the legal structures, the reporting, operating norms, getting the project we've recruited over the last year. Uh, we have released, working with the foundation of Transmart version 1.1, built on Postgres, so it's fully open. Uh, we've got five projects being supported right now. When we set the project, we planned for a lot of this centralized, but now what we're seeing is a, a federated development, so with a lot of different installations at different sites, reflecting where the, the main projects are located. We're also starting to curate up retrospective public content. We do have a beta release of that content, which you, you can actually browse. And we're doing further work around requirements gathering and trying to manage demand. There's a, there's a lot more demand 
that we can actually manage with the current resources. And so this is something like trying to prioritize our resources and how we best support, optimally support the IMI project today. So as I say, when we first set up this project, we expected to archive a lot of the data, to bring a lot of the data into one central place. But for a number of reasons, partly due to the preferred model way these projects want to work, partly because of the restrictions of where we can and can't move data within Europe, is that what we're probably not going to be moving to quickly as a, as a IMI centralized archive, but we're probably going to move more into a world of federated querying and analytics. So where we see individual instances of these Transmart eTrix instances, but being able to surface on top of each one of those a linked data endpoint where we can actually run a, um, a federated search across these. So this is, was not envisioned at the beginning of the project, and this is something we're working through right now. We're putting the plans in place. So what you should be seeing over the next six to nine months in this area is the ability technically to do this. We then got to get into the conversation with individual projects of what metadata they are willing to surface and hopefully start to open up the number of translational studies that have been run to date but also are running right now, and so making this data a lot more available. And ultimately, where we want to get to is an integrated stratified medicine ecosystem to reflect the operating models of uh, modern R&D and pharma. So we want a common open infrastructures with federation of searchable archives, ability to transfer data between organizations within consortia, a good healthy ecosystem of commercial and not-for-profit service providers in this space, and ideally developing that essential analytics and visualization toolbox. And I will leave it there. Thank you, Ian, for your contribution there. I think that will certainly set the tone for our other presentations. Our next presenter is Bernard Munoz. And uh, let's hear what you've got to say, Bernard. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bernard Munoz. I am the founder of the uh, InnoSync Center for Research in Biomedical Innovation, which is a think tank that works with uh, biomedical research organizations and helps them become better innovators. Thank you to the organizers for allowing me to talk about the disruption of healthcare and life sciences that is about to be triggered by open data or the emergence of open data and semantic technologies. I'd like to start with a quote by John Hackenbush, Quackenbush at Harvard University, which goes back, looks back a little bit at the history of scientific revolution. And uh, he commented that if you think about uh, past revolution in history, they've been driven by one thing, and that is the availability of data. All the way back to Copernicus, uh, to uh, quantum mechanics, it is data that drives innovation. And this is a good omen, because uh, we've had lots of data available to us in the biosciences uh, in, the last, uh, in the past, but uh, especially in the last 10 years. But this is likely to be dwarfed uh, by the emergence of massive new streams of data. Let's go back uh, for a second about uh, what became available in the, in the last 10 years. And uh, basically, every area of sciences uh, now has uh, lots of data that have been captured in databases. And the good news is that most of those databases uh, that are high quality, by the way, are uh, either uh, free of charge or available for a nominal cost. Just 10, 12 years ago, uh, to have access to that data, you had to work for a large pharmaceutical company or a large biomedical research institute. Uh, this is no longer the case. Uh, so uh, it has triggered some changes already in the innovation ecosystem, with a lot of individual scientists uh, availing themselves of that data and doing all kinds of interesting things with it. Well, those scientists are going to be overjoyed soon uh, because we're now seeing technology emerging that is going to provide data flows that will dwarf what is currently available. We already have almost 100,000 healthcare apps that are available for download that can basically monitor and capture every bit of health data about you that you can think of. And uh, we also have biosensors uh, that can monitor, you know, your blood pressure, your blood rate, uh, your, your, your pulse, uh, your heart rate, uh, your, you know, breathing, how you sleep, uh, your movement, your effort, how many steps you, you walk and, and how fast you walk them and how many stairs and so forth. So, uh, we've got, uh, uh, you know, high resolution cameras that can be used to take pictures of uh, 
you know, your retina and uh, uh, programs can then read your lipid profile or all kinds of other things uh, from that uh, picture. Uh, we can take, you know, pictures of melanoma or, you know, arthritic hands and uh, uh, transmit that to uh, computers and, 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 and scientists uh, who can basically do all kinds of, of interesting things with the data. We've got plug-in devices that can uh, take an electrocardiogram or an electroencephalogram and all the data data is captured in real time and uh, transmitted wirelessly by telemetry to uh, the cloud, basically, where it can, it can be picked up by scientists to do all kind of interesting things. Some patient community are already, you know, ahead and using uh, those data flows uh, in order to help biomedical scientists uh, do their work. Uh, the rare, rare disease patient community uh, is already out there uh, as a matter of necessity for them because with uh, nearly 7,000 diseases in need of uh, treatment, uh, having data about their diseases available in open free access is the only way to entice uh, the scientific community to come and work on those, especially since scientists know that in every research project, about 80% of the time and the money is spent on collecting and curating the data. So those organizations who do that for them are very attractive to scientists uh, who can use that to multiply their uh, research productivity quite significantly. It's happening in rare diseases. It's happening in oncology, Parkinson, Alzheimer's. Basically, it is starting to happen everywhere. So this is good, but of course, data without software wouldn't be very helpful. And the good news is that uh, we've got an explosion of software to accompany the explosion of data, and it covers every facet uh, that you can think of. Statistical analysis, visualization, machine learning, network analysis. Uh, we've got specialized search engines such as Discover, the one developed by uh, AutoForce, uh, uh, that can also play a critical role in uh, enabling this, uh, this new age. And and of course, we've got uh, unlimited storage and uh, data processing capability in the cloud, uh, which uh, just a few years ago, five years ago, uh, was, was, was a dream, uh, and it's now available to uh, anyone. Uh, so this is very, very powerful, and we have not leveraged that power yet, uh, but it, it is about to happen. And to illustrate what uh, may happen, let me draw some comparison there. You may have heard about uh, concepts such as smart cities, smart homes, and smart cars. Uh, this is a notion that you can take a, a very complex body uh, in a conceptual sense uh, and embed it with uh, uh, all kinds of biosensors and monitor the life and the health of uh, that uh, system uh, in real time. Uh, so in cities, you have biosensors, uh, you know, sprinkled uh, everywhere in the city, bus stops, intersections, traffic lights, uh, highways, uh, streets, you name it. And uh, they inform uh, the city managers about what's happening in real time so that traffic, for example, they can can take preemptive action as problem and develop instead of uh, after problem as, as develop, and this is a much more effective way of dealing uh, with those things. Uh, same thing for homes, same things for trucks. I mean, there are industrial trucks uh, now uh, that uh, have uh, sensors on every part of their engine and, 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 and their entire buildup, uh, uh, and those parts constantly uh, transmit uh, data about uh, the performance uh, of, uh, you know, of, of the parts. Uh, to uh, you know, a website uh, where those data are analyzed, and uh, the program can do very smart things, such as predict when a part is likely to fail, uh, or if it does fail, uh, look at uh, the condition in which it was used uh, when it failed, uh, so that uh, in a future better trucks and better parts can be can be designed. So all this is becoming available uh, to our body. We'll soon have biosensors to monitor the function uh, of every one of our organs uh, and uh, do the same thing, generate data that uh, will allow us to predict uh, when a particular organ is likely to fail. Uh, you can channel those data flows into uh, computer programs uh, that uh, already exist, that have been developed uh, to to help diagnose patients, and uh, those programs uh, will, will, will take it, those inflow of data and uh, identify that when somebody is uh, developing you know, a, a disease, where it is uh, you know, heart failure or whether it is uh, you know, something else. 
bone that is about to break or, or those sort of things. So it is uh, very exciting because it will change the way uh, we do science, and we will see in a second. But there is only one problem with all this, and this data can only be helpful if it is linked, if it is connected, integrated. Otherwise, uh, sciences cannot really use it. And uh, we already have evidence uh, that uh, suggests that uh, when data is linked and open and available to scientists, truly extraordinary things can happen. For example, you may be familiar with the Framingham Heart Study, which started in uh, 1948 and is still going. In the first 60 years of its existence, it generated publication at the rate of about 31 a year. In uh, 2007, they added to uh, the data that were uh, that had been collected new data, uh, genotypic data and phenotypic data. And uh, in the following four years, the number of publication has jumped from 31 to 88 per year. So you know, almost treble. Uh, so, you know, if you look at the medical insights uh, that uh, just this simple addition of a couple of, uh, you know, databases has done to that, you know, well-known study, uh, it is, it is uh, momentous. Uh, we've got another example with the OSDD platform, which is something that was created in India uh, back in 2008 to accelerate the development of drug for tuberculosis. And now uh, 7,500 scientists, uh, uh, volunteer scientists, I should say, communicate to tackle uh, the challenge of developing those drugs. And uh, in uh, you know, the last five years, uh, they have uh, grown to originate uh, almost two-thirds of the paper published in, in that particular area of sciences. And it all runs on a shoestring on a budget of about two and a half million dollars a year, which is uh, unknown uh, in unprecedented in biomedical research. Uh, so we're seeing all kinds of uh, evidence uh, that uh, suggest uh, that we are on a cusp of uh, transformational changes in the industry that are being enabled by uh, the availability of a massive flow of data and the tools uh, such as Discover uh, to uh, process and connect and make sense of that data. And it will uh, enable a, a number of uh, fascinating uh, development. For example, predictive health. Uh, just I just described it, you know, just like you can predict when trucks will fail. You will be able to predict when our body parts will fail and take preemptive action uh, before uh, that failure happens uh, with dramatic impact on the health status of, of the patients. Uh, we will be able to uh, practice smarter personalized medicine there are many diseases uh, for which we don't really have a natural history, not just rare diseases, but things like chronic fatigue syndrome where, you know, it's fuzzy and um, the physicians just don't understand it very well. Uh, well, uh, the data flows captured by your biosensors will give us the information that we need to get a baseline on those diseases uh, so that we can start developing treatments uh, that can be measured, whose effect can be measured against the baseline, and we'll be able to see efficacy and how much efficacy. Uh, we'll also uh, uh, be able to assess the effectiveness of treatments in real time. If I go to the doctor and give me a treatment, uh, uh, you know, within days, uh, uh, I'll uh, be able to start measuring uh, what sort of an impact this treatment is having on me. The doctor will have that information. If uh, you know he wants to uh, uh, up the dose, uh, he can do that, and the impact of that change can be monitored in real time. So you can optimize the drug dosage. You can have you know real time capture and, and monitoring of the side effects. So uh, it's, it'll be a different medicine, really. But it will also have dramatic impact on uh, clinical research, which is becoming very, very uh, expensive, uh, and uh, cost is an in, in, in increasing problem in our ability to conduct uh, biomedical research and, and produce innovation. Uh, if you've got, you know, smaller, shorter, data-rich uh, trials that are monitored in real time, you will be able to do uh, those trials, uh, you know, more rapidly because, you know, you sample, you get thousands of data points per day or per hour on uh, each patient instead of a few data points once a month. So the scientist will be able to understand uh, what's happening, you know, in a patient that is enrolled in a trial at the level of detail that was never available uh, before. 
and the data will be high quality data because it's collected you know wirelessly in a non invasive way uh, with no possibility of of uh, accessing that data uh, while it is you know being collected and editing you know parts that uh, one might might not like uh, so the regulators actually love uh, those trends because uh, it gives them unparalleled insights into what is happening uh, in the testing of a drug uh, and it gives that, that that information in real time at any point so they can you know, go to a trial and find out not just how groups of patients uh, are doing, but how individual patients are doing. It helps assess uh, the uh, impact of, uh, of a treatment at the patient level, uh, whereas in the past uh, we had to limit ourselves to, to looking at the population level. And if something goes wrong, the regulators can, can react much, much quicker. So it will have an uh, incredibly uh, profound effect on uh, the, um, the ecosystem, the, the, the innovation uh, ecosystem in the biosciences. So to summarize, uh, you've got uh, data streams that are bound to uh, increase in volume uh, by order of magnitude in the next few years. And then you've got the cloud-based infrastructure that is becoming ever so powerful you need to connect the two uh, in order to really enable the, the, the sort of transformation that I just described, and it is precisely uh, what uh, the tools that I just discovered have, have been designed to do. So it is very exciting, and uh, on those good words, uh, uh, thank you for your attention, and um, I'm open for questions. Thank you, Bernard, for that. Finally, our last speaker is Hans Constant, who is the CEO of Ontoforce. Uh, Hans, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for having us here. First of all, we talked about patients and helping patients with the information. But there is a high purpose to this, right? So why do we do this? So I felt the pain personally with patients, and I think all of us do in our intimate circles, is how, how difficult it is when somebody gets, gets ill and, and is is diagnosed how difficult it is to get to the right information quickly. And even as experts, it's difficult, so let it be as a non-expert. So this data is out there, but how do we really get to the right data quickly? So when you have a data and you don't share this, it's your data, and it's probably very well protected, but what can you do with it? This data, it's out there, and experts need quite some time and money to find the right data if it's not shared by definition. Because big data processing needs a lot of time and money and the ad hoc data production goes very slow. So we need too many iterations to go through the data and to find the data if we don't share it. So this is a call to action to share more data and link data. So sharing and open data, just putting the data out there is not enough. This is about making the data accessible and linked because it's not about big data and say, but it's about actionable and data. Who can make this data actionable? Who can interpret the data better than others? So there's also some other initiatives that inspired me, and it's written in the article in the uh, Drug Discovery World, but the things that inspired me were initiatives like uh, iWire. So in iWire, if you think about this, this is to map the connectome, so the brain. And in fact, the, the, the whole idea here is that can a video game really change the way we look at data? So there's 80 billion cells there, and these slices, these images, need to be colored. And uh, already the lab at MIT of Professor Siong did already with AI a lot of work on coloring these cells and how to map these cells. It needs an extra 50 hours for cells to really be at a high level, and the human eye needs to, to work on that. So we need 80 billion cells multiplied by 50 hours to, to clean up the whole connector. So that takes us way too much time, right? If you would work one hour a day, or each hour every day, the 24 hours around the world, it would take us half a billion of years to get there. So this is too long. So this is where they managed to, to think differently and to really think about video gaming. So there's a lot of gamification out there on tools, and the fact that the human race, really, when you look at it right now, they play like 3 billion hours per week on video gaming, the humans. So can we use that, and can we use the fact that people are open to a video game rather than a paper to, to adopt them. And with iWire, please check it out, they did it. So there are already 50,000 people and they're cleaning up the connectome and the cells and they're coloring the cells of the brain by doing that. So it's crowd, it's open, and it works. So the other thing is also, there's a lot of discussion out there. So can we improve health 
for the authentic engagement of communities and individuals. And that means not only experts, right, but everybody. Is this possible or not? So the connector, uh, mapping that with iWire is one example, but also thinking about how, how this can be done better is with initiatives, if you look around, and Etrix is another initiative, but there's a lot of initiatives going on there, like the init initiative Genetic Alliance led by Sharon Terry, right? They're connecting 1,000 disease advocacy organizations, universities, government organizations, private companies, and public organizations. They even have their own biobanks, and they're serving quite some people with the data and opening the data. So you see these initiatives like iWire, Genetic Alliance, and there's many other, but it starts to grow. But how are we going to connect the data? So this is where we think with open and linked data, so not only having the open data, but having it in linked, that we can do much more. Because then we can share the data we learn about patients, about diseases, about research. And Bernard also mentioned the, the open open source drug discovery, really an, an initiative on the, on the shoestring of 2.5 million, making a difference. This is open data. And it would become even more powerful if you can link it and reuse it. So this is where the linked data can work. It already started a while ago, so uh, it was mentioned earlier on also with Etrix and before that. I think it started uh, really to get more active with the Healthcare Life Sciences Group uh, in, in the W3C and the people surrounding that initiative. Where we already talked about translational science and we built this translational medicine ontology. Because the idea is not to have just data sets, and, and Etrix was already covering quite uh, a bunch of them, but this should be translational science data sets, so data sets from bench to bed and bed to bench. So it comes from the bottom here to understand the mode of actions and the targets in the human body, the biology of the diseases, to which compounds or other outcomes or, or could help to, to really heal the patient and have the better patient outcomes. So in the right level, you see, which they call also the value of that and uh, bridging data. In healthcare life science, in the right side, you see like consultation data, diagnosis data, treatment data, and the outcome. Uh, so the healthcare data should be linked to the whole life sciences data, where you go from a target to a molecule in the 12 years and to speed it up. And we're convinced when this data is not only open, but also linked, that this could speed up significantly. And even by not just only adding your data, but also by, by contributing on the cleanup and the curation of the data so that we all use the same nomenclature, so even without data, it will ease up the world because then we can start to really talk to each other and we can understand and interpret and analyze the data better. We had an example in the summer where there was a hackathon at a semantic web conference in San Francisco where there was a hackathon about integrating data. And so where Dean Ellerman was leading that group, but there were far more people, there were like 13 people in that group, and there's six key people contributing this. But they integrated three data sources via Sparkle endpoint in minutes. And that was really key, right? Imagine you can add in data in minutes rather than projects of three months or hours of, or weeks. This is a difference where linking data and adding in data should be more easy. Because we want to start also where the Sparkle endpoint ends, right? So Bernard mentioned it in how to link this data and visualize it. So we start with the Sparkle endpoint ends, so it's a data service that ends and we want to integrate it. An example we had is on hospital data. So um, Drupal also, they have RDFA embedded. And it took only minutes to, to really get the hospital site secured and the privacy and everything, uh, of course, uh, keeping into respect. It took only minutes to add that data in to show that data. And people could find new patient communities, could find outcomes from clinical trials much more easy and, and, and the schemas and how to get to the data. So this was an example where it really worked in minutes to get in data. Then I want to jump to another part of it, which is these tools. Steve Jobs said it, design for a purpose, or design is how it works. So right now, when we look at all these data sets, the interfaces are not really user-friendly most of the time. It's not easy to find the data. It's definitely not slick like the Apple applications or an App Store. And it's also not fun because it takes too much hours and it takes too much time. So we want to change that because the mantra also for us is where we see adoption, it's not in the expert's hands, but it's in the hands of all scientists and accessible. And that's why we say also it needs to be as easy as Google, as slick as Apple and fun as Angry Birds. Because tools shouldn't be pain. Tools should be fun to use, even if it's research. 
So this is also what we want to propagate forward, is really not only the link data, but also the interfaces and the usability. Because we tend to be, in these communities and these programs, there's a lot of very smart and expert people, but who focuses on the user? The user is key, and it needs to be usable. So right now, we already have some, some, some ideas about this. We worked on this with some end users, and we have our first prototypes. And one of the things that's really key also is, once you do search and you make the data actionable, is can you share the patterns you search for? And can you collaborate on searches? And this is something we also want to add, which is called collaborative intelligence. How can we commonly not only connect and open data, link it, but also collaborate on it and curate it? The vision and the mission we have and the people that we work with and the partners is really to make this translational science open and to bridge the data gap so that researchers, doctors across the globe can get access to it. And it's not only for the farm and the bite, but also for the patients, the doctors, and other researchers, because this personalized medicine is so needed right now, and that's what we work for. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. In fact, I'd like to thank all of the uh, panelists for their valuable contribution and enlightening us as to the value of semantic technologies. Okay, we have a few questions. I think the first one, probably to you, uh, Hans, what do you consider the biggest challenges to integrating data and the security implications between EU, Asia, African, Oceania countries? Yeah, that's a good question indeed. So I think the privacy is key, right? Is how do we make sure that there's the right kind of encryption and authentication? And at this point, we only start with the English language, but we're sure also, and there are some examples from some partners we work with, is... If you really use ontologies and you even apply language paradigms in there that you can even translate an African, a native speaking information to that. So the translation is not the key issue. I think the most, the biggest challenge is to protect the security and the privacy of the patients across uh, out there. And of course, there's some challenges still with the Sparkle endpoints because it's a really nice ID, uh, but there still needs to be researched on, on the benchmarking of Sparkle endpoints. So that we show once we put out the Sparkle endpoints that the data stores underneath can handle the requests coming in and that it's performing well to, 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 to be used. So it's the performance of a federated crime with Sparkle endpoints, which, we're, which is not ready yet, as well as the privacy and the security of the data are the two biggest challenges, to my opinion. Yeah. Okay. Anything to add on that, Ian? Uh, yeah, I'll just make one other comment. I totally agree with what Hans is uh, alluding to there. I think the other challenge is, is understanding what you really need to integrate with dealing with both primary raw data as well as process data and really understanding what the questions that the community has over that data and making sure that we're integrating at the right level um, because you may put a lot of effort in integrating data you don't need to integrate. And so I think it's just important to really understand what, what are the questions and you know, where's the sweet spot for that integration. Otherwise, I, I fully concur with what Hans is saying. You know, there, there are some significant challenges based on security and, and, and also on the, the how you bring the, the standards organizations together, especially on the, um, the ontologies and the, the semantics we're, we're dealing with. Um, there are, you know, the experience I'm finding with a lot of projects we're interacting with is that you find a lot of reinvention on how they want to describe experiments and data. And it's how you encourage into, into the clinic and into the, the researchers um, the adoption of existing standards and not reinvention and how you make that community work. And that's, that's a real challenge and I don't think we've cracked that as a community yet. How do we, I mean, from a perspective of the regulatory bodies, uh, so the FDA and, and all the others around the world, I mean, how are they reacting to this? Are, are, they, are they being you know, fruitful and forthcoming in helping you to do all this or not? Personally, I've not had direct in, uh, contact with the FDA on this. Um, we know the, the FDA are working with groups like the Transmart Foundation. They're very interested in open technologies um, and how you, these can be adopted. Um, again, you've got, uh, you know, they've been also been very important in working with groups like CDISC regards clinical data standards for submissions. And so, but this is not an area I've worked directly with the, the, the regulators yet. So I'm, I'm gonna, not going to comment. From a European perspective, I have some context with uh, the European regulations, and they see a lot of value in it, because for 
them also, right, they, would, they want to speed up the process and find data. So they said if all these data sets, and it's in fact indeed what Ian said, the fraud challenge, I would call it, is the reuse of the nomenclatures. And it's not even reuse, it's, it's agreeing on what's good enough to move forward. And this would be a big win if we would have a common language that we all apply to opening up our data sources because this is not even technology based. It's, it's just get it to work. And, and, and I know that the regulators in Europe are very forwardly looking to this and also engaging with us to work this out. Excellent. But another question here is asking what the security issues may be with, with cloud storage security. Quick answer for me, so uh, I was lucky to have worked with a security expert uh, over two years. And at this point, it, it's a very tricky question anyhow, right? But if you look at some initiatives like um, when the cloud computing really started to accelerate, and I like to use also how Salesforce.com is proceeding, right? Where in the beginning they also said we'll never put all our, all our data in there. But if you look at the audits and all the information there, some of the cloud providers have much better security than ever internally could set up by even big pharma multinationals. So it's more a pragmatic question than the technology. The technology is out there to do this. I think the cloud computing is getting more mature in this and is at a professional level to be used. If you look at banking and all that, it's used. So I think we're ready for that and it's a technology question. I think the biggest challenge and even more I think in, in pharma is are we ready to make that change, and are we ready to do this? So, Ian, maybe you can comment to this. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. A lot of it's down to the individual policies within the farmer on, the, on their comfortableness, if that's the word, on adopting these clouds. And you're seeing, you're seeing different speeds of adoption through the different farmer. One of the challenges I know that comes up is, is actually where the data is physically hosted. So if you do have patient data and it can only be stored in a certain region or a certain country, and understanding the cloud footprint of that cloud provider is often comes up as well. So it's not just about security, but actually understanding where it physically is, what server it's actually sitting on. One probably last question. Privacy laws of individual countries. You know, we've all we all seem to have our own different laws. How do we get over that problem? Uh, so, so I think if you look at the U.S., probably that there's, there's a better way to do this there. If we look at Europe, uh, it, it is more difficult, right? Because you, you have Europe, and then you have all the countries with their different legal setups. So it, it's extremely difficult. And in fact, we're depending on the regulators there, and you know what the impact of that is. So it's the policymakers that need to be triggered. So this would be also the call of action, not only on opening data, but also on pushing on, on, on the policymakers to, to, to also align there to, to make our life more easy. And this is why I really like also the, the bigger initiatives like OpenFlex and like eTrix and IMI uh, joint and the, and the thing, because they have a body that can influence that. I think if you're a lonely player, and definitely not on the false, but if you're already a big pharma, but if you're a consortium of pharma, and you have already a European contribution there, then I think you, you can make the change happen. How quick it will go, don't get me started on that one. <laughs> yeah, but there, there, are, there are within IMI, and um, what we're seeing is, is the different projects getting together, discussing some a lot of these issues. So there are consortia, consortia, just, you know, trying to uh, look at these issues. But I think it also comes back down to the comment I was making earlier about what we're actually trying to bring out and integrate and link. Um, the further you can move this, the, the information away from uh, you know, an identifiable patient, so i.e. not using coded data, moving a lot more into the anonymized space, you know, you, you end up with different restrictions regarding data privacy. Um, and so I think we do need to be careful about what we really need to integrate. Um, and how that then, what the implications are for the data protection laws that exist, especially within the different European uh, countries. So, you know, I think, I think first of all, it's about moving, you know, in, the, in improving the paradigms we've been discussing here in, in bringing that data together, you know, which we can do without actually being falling foul of data protection laws. And then once you start to show the value, you know, then working through what it actually means for um, the, what you need to do with more identifiable data, patient identifiable data. Yeah, okay. I just second that because there's so much data out there that doesn't put some privacy or ethics that we could already get a lot of sense out. One last question. 
How do you plan to get everyone using the same ontology? And the question is also asking, is schema.org the answer to solving this problem? I think it's it's big consortia that will make it happen, right? This is again about the, uh, the change in, in in adopting and working together, and uh, it's not the technology. It's a schema that or can be a, an answer to that, but it's first in agreeing on the vocabulary because before thinking about what technology to use. Yeah, and if you think about it from the farm industry, you know you saw some announcements maybe last year around Transcelerate and the. Mm -hmm. Big investments of big, some of the big farmer are making with the regulators and organizations like CDISC, and part of that is around trying to standardize a lot of the ontologies which we use in the, in the farmer space. So you, you start to see, you know, the companies really invest in this area as they recognize that these are bottlenecks for our, our R&D processes, and that will only help coordinate in the, uh, the ontology space. Excellent. All right, look, it looks like we've, we've run out of time. Once again, uh, a big thank you to all our speakers. Thank you and goodbye. If you'd like to view the original webinar recording, then there's a link to the full video in the show notes. Also, if you enjoyed this episode, then you can find more webinars on the webinar section of our website, also linked. As a reminder, you can register for DDW on our website, ddw-online.com, and also follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Thanks for listening, and we'll hope to see you in next week's episode.